Hi, this is Libby. And this is Roberta. And this is Art Blog Radio. Today we're at Bryn Mawr College talking with Brian Wallace. Brian is the curator and academic liaison for Arts and Artifacts. We know Brian from when he was director of the galleries at Moore College of Art and Design from 2003 to 2006, where he did a very large exhibit, among other things, of works and installations by contemporary Brazilian-based artist Artur Barrio. At Bryn Mawr, Brian is in charge of the collection of art and artifacts. Brian commissioned four artists to create new works on the theme of college graduation. So Brian... Thanks for speaking with us. Uh, You now work at a women's college, and you previously worked at another women's college, which would be more college. (laughs) But in between, you were the curator at the Dorsky Museum at SUNY New Paltz in upstate New York, a co-ed environment. So let's talk about the difference between co-ed and a women's college. Uh, Colleges are places that each, in their own way, try to balance a withdrawal from the world and an analysis of the world. And so colleges are constantly negotiating how they're going to relate or temporarily not relate to the to the rest of the world. So how does Bryn Mawr do it? it what, how, what is Bryn Mawr's approach? Bryn Mawr's approach is to be unabashedly academic and to really challenge and really support students in their academic inquiries. So let's um, bring into that context the teaching of studio art, Mm -hmm. because I believe that at some point the college decided perhaps that it wasn't part of its academic mission to teach studio art. Uh, That is true. The uh, Bryn Mawr and Haverford College have a really terrific, it's not like a booster, but it's, it's been great for me. Um, my colleagues in Haverford have been really helpful, and I've been able to do some things for them as well. So this bi-co relationship, as well as um, our relationship with Swarthmore, Trico, is a very good way to share resources and avoid duplication of certain efforts. It saves money. It makes sense to focus an area of academic endeavor at one campus. So, a number of years ago, it was decided that generally theater and dance would be housed at Bryn Mawr. Well, let's talk about the show that you have up right now. Okay. Um, It's uh, called Docu Commencement. features Jennifer Livonian, James Johnson, Kay Healy, and Gilbert Plantinga. Is that how you pronounce Mm -hmm. it? Three of them are artists who we know well from Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. I guess I want to know, how did you find those four artists? After all, you haven't been around that long in Philadelphia since, you know, since your right. return. Right. Well, I, you, you were kind mentioning that I had worked at Moore before. One of my jobs there was to uh, work with artists from the area. Um, that's how I first encountered uh, James Johnson's work. Um, he teaches at more. He does. He does. But when he was just a slip of a lad, he had a show at the Fleischer. He was one of the Fleischer Challenge folks. And I saw his work there, um, and we just remained in touch. And, yes, he's now um, running or helping run um, one of the newer departments there at Moore. So his interest in architecture and in iconography, um, Daniel Heyman, a printmaker, uh, and I'm proud to say a friend of mine um, recommended, I believe, both Kay Healy and Jennifer Livonian to me. I really loved Jennifer's ability to compress a narrative without losing the telling detail that she deploys so well in her past work. And I'm really happy to say um, in the Poetry Winner piece that, that she developed as part of this commission, Kay Healy, too. I mean, she worked very hard and also was just so open to serendipity uh, in the course of developing her project to the extent of literally running outside her studio to capture with her digital camera um, a big piece of the final visual component of her installation here. Can really you describe happy. it a little bit? Yeah, I was really happy with how that worked out. She, um, the way we set it up was 
because commencement is such a complicated time of transition for the institutions and the individuals involved, it's not really clear who's getting left behind, who's moving forward, what relationships are going to be like after this you know, sort of silly and overproduced and yet profoundly meaningful ceremony. And it's, it's just, just a raft of cliches, the, the white tent, the awkward parental moments. So, you know, who's the, is that your friend? Um, how old am I? Suddenly I'm 16, not 21. And for, for, for the institution, it's also a very important moment. I mean, this is the institution's product. That's Bryn Mawr's brand out there. <laughs> so with all of these things in play, it was beyond me to try to summarize it, but I thought that these four artists would, would provide four very different perspectives on what that meant. So Kay, being one of the people who had graduated a little bit more recently than some of the other artists, Gilbert Plantinga, um, uh, Kay was sort of full of her own recollections of her own experience and sort of wandered around. She'd missed kind of a days for a couple of hours and eventually crashed for a couple hours on a couch that she found in the theater building. And so that couch became this sort of symbol of comfort and renewal. She took photographs of it. She eventually made a large silkscreen print of it in an edition of six, and was planning on wheat pasting those around the campus. And how large were they? Oh, life-size couch. So it's it's wider than you can stretch your arms. Um, and as she was nearing the conclusion of the project, she felt that it needed something else. I'm, I'm paraphrasing a, a studio conversation we had. Then one day she heard this ruckus, saw a dump truck outside her studio in South Philly about to munch uh, a couch. So she ran downstairs and captured this really iconic footage of the sanitation workers feeding a couch into the back of a big old garbage truck, and it, it eats it and then drives away into the far, far distance. Now, I've never driven in Philadelphia like that. I hit every light. this traffic, bicycles, what have you. But the truck just drives away like she'd arranged the whole thing. So the installation is a silkscreen couch down at the ground level and a video projection above it of this other couch life cycle moment. Working in a very different way, but also with a camera, Gilbert Plantinga. Um, how old is he? He's, well, he's older than I am. And how old are you? <laughs> 51. Um, Gilbert uses, among other things, he's, he's quite a good uh, large format photographer. So he traipsed around campus with um, a large view camera and a tripod and a couple of student assistants. No spontaneity there. When it was time to take, or as Gilbert would carefully say, make a photograph, um, he would have to set up, stop, ask people to cooperate, engage them in a bit of conversation while he did what he needed to do with the camera, and then ask them you know, to hold still in a way that made some people wonder what the heck that machine was. Um, but he captured a, a number of really terrific images on, um, into the selection that's in the exhibition. Um, he also he heard the Elgar pomp and circumstance, uh, and then also later in the day happens to hear Frank Zappa's Peaches and Regalia. Gilbert realized that the songs share melodic and other structures, so that led him to realize, because he'd also been looking on campus at some of these uh, moments when quite old architecture comes into contact with quite new architecture, those seams and the connection between those two pieces of music prompted him to um, bear down hard on a suite of software he'd been working on and develop an, an interactive piece that if you stand in front of it, it sort of fades back and forth between different views of these old, new architectural themes, and it um, emphasizes either a recording of the Elgar or the Zappa, depending upon where you stand in the space. So it's fun, subtle, interactive work. So he shot pictures of people. Primarily, and also some scenes. And they have a, a very as Libby was pointing out earlier, a very classical 
construction and composition to them. These young ladies are sitting on very upright posture with their legs together, with wearing contemporaneous clothes and flip-flops on their feet, but they could be a classical statue of some sort. Gilbert's a great fan of the orthogonal structures in the viewed scene what does that on mean? the ground glass <laughs> of sorry time of out curator speak yeah the, it's he, it's the it's the geometries of the space he's able to depict that Gilbert innately really responds to at a visceral level I mean if he was in the room now he'd be moving the camera so that it captured that row of cubbies so all the shadows and lines and so forth would line up symmetrically. He would probably want to photograph us in a way that emphasized the diagonals and the symmetries of the table and the way we're seated at this corner of it. So he's interested in translating three-dimensional active space into a two-dimensional image, which that's hardly a new concept. I mean, that is classical in the manner in which he chooses who to photograph and who not. I think there's also an element of you know, the, the selection there has to do with what these individuals look like, but also Gilbert's very quick sense of their personality. So let's talk about your curating of this mm-hmm. show, because on the one hand, it sounds like you were rather hands-off on giving the artists their leeway to make something, but on the other hand, you required them to be in residence for 24 consecutive hours on the campus over the commencement weekend. Yeah. So that's rather rigid. It is, it is rigid. It was self-consciously rigid. I mean, I, 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 I hope with a sense of humor, um, we were able to sort of poke a little bit at this curator-artist relationship. Both parties have certain resources, both parties have certain needs. We rely upon one another. Um, there are tensions between and among the roles. It's, it, it, was, it was fun um, and also a little bit, I mean, not kind of sadistic, uh, but <laughs> at least a sort of nod in the direction of sadism to insist that their residency only last but must last 24 hours. The idea of commencement as this really compressed zone of transition really drove the idea that we wanted to really focus on this one period. So who, excuse me, who owns the work now? Right. We, this was a new experience um, for the college, so I took the opportunity uh, presented by such a complicated campus-wide project because, I mean, this is not just an art show in the gallery. This was working with everyone from uh, campus public safety to residential life to undergraduate and graduate deans, um, the campus legal council. And I was able to find funds to compensate the artists for their time and their work, but the contract specifically states that the work remains the property of the artist. Um, it removed the obligation that college had to acquire work that might not have been up to that individual artist's usual standards. Um, it, it just helped to sort of keep things clear. We're now talking with a couple of the artists about possibly acquiring their works for the collection. There's been a lot of interest. Um, my colleagues in public safety have poked their heads in a couple times. Um, some of the deans of undergraduate study who haven't had the opportunity to see what's been happening in special collections have come to see the show. So it's been a nice way to um, sort of extend into some uh, uh, areas we hadn't reached. What does special collections mean? Right. Special collections, I mean, there's no museum here. Uh, And yet... Arguably, there are all or most of the components of a really good small college museum here. And we have a variety of different collections, uh, art and artifacts collection, which numbers upwards of 50,000 objects. 
there's a huge uh, rare book collection, early printed books, incunabula, manuscripts. Uh, there is also uh, a college archive, which includes everything from uh, papers that come to us in a fairly orderly fashion from different offices on campus, everything from early film footage of May Day celebrations. With Catherine Hepburn in it? Uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Hundreds of young women doing these really unbelievably elaborate Maypole celebrations out in the green here. Uh, items of clothing and, and, and on and on. Really a, a very rich collection of items. Thank you, Brian. We've been Thank speaking you. with Brian Wallace today at the Canada Library at Bryn Mawr College. Thank you so very much. Thanks, Roberta. Thanks, Libby. Art Blog Radio is brought to you by theartblog.org. Thanks to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation. Also, we want to thank Peter Crimmins, who makes us sound good. He's our editor. And thanks to Eric Biondo for his music. You can download these podcasts at theartblog.org slash radio.